Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where we're doing a series of interviews on the challenges facing the United States Navy, uh, as well as the United States and its allies. And we're here with a uh, professor of uh, strategy, uh, Professor uh, Dave Stone, uh, PhD from uh, Yale uh, in history, author of the book uh, Russia in the Great War, which came out in uh, 2015 uh, at the University of Kansas Press. Uh, is is the publisher. Uh, you focus on Russia and uh, and Soviet history. Uh, and I apologize if I interpose Russia and the Soviets because there's a little bit of redux going on now. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, Russia, uh, the new Russian Navy. I think that folks have tendencies of sort of thinking of Soviet models of this, whereas the Russian military is a very, very different military than it was in Soviet, the Soviet era. Uh, a lot more capable in a lot of ways, uh, but not as much, not as large, although they can still deliver a lot of mass and a lot of classical thinking. And Russia is still very much a land power, and I know that that's where a lot of your expertise still is. But talk to us about the Russian Navy, the revitalization of Russian of the Russian Navy under Vladimir Putin, and how that ties into the broader Russian military strategy, if you want to call it the Gerasimov Doctrine or anything else, of how Russia intends to use force uh, or things short of force and hybrid means in advancing its national aims in this sort of new great power era. Sure. So the, the Russian Navy, I think, is best thought of as paralleling developments in other segments of the Russian military. The Soviet Union had enormous amounts of hardware. And now every branch of the Russian military is much, much smaller than it was in the Soviet period. And so the Navy is smaller, the Army is smaller, the Air Force is smaller. Um, that said, elements of those forces are highly professional and highly effective. There are still big chunks of it that are not. And so Russia now is in a position of having a capable but limited military capacity, and it has to be very cautious about how and when and where it chooses to use that capability. And so I think one of the things that people have been calling hybrid warfare is a way in which the Russians are trying to compensate for the fact that they have this very effective but very limited military means at their disposal. And so using political warfare, using influence, using money, all of these are ways to try to get their political objectives and not have to use kinetic power unless they really have to. Now, certainly Russia has demonstrated that it is willing to use military force. It's done it in Georgia, it's done it in Ukraine, it's doing it in Syria now. But essentially it's doing that in carefully selected spots where it needs to use military force and it's seeing it's an inability to get what it wants through methods short of actual military violence. Uh, so how in this tapestry of kind of capabilities that Russia is confronting its allies with, right? Uh, precision fires, hypersonic missile, you know, a promise to have a hypersonic uh, weapon, precision, long-range hypersonic weapon in service, apparently being used against Florida, uh, if, you, if you looked at uh, Putin's uh, March uh, addresses as any sign. Um, you know, there are a lot of discrete military capabilities, you know, mass fires. I mean, we saw the two Ukrainian regiments disappear, uh, or, or battalions, uh, if I recall, in, in the Ukraine uh, under, you know, mass fires, very Soviet era the approach of using artillery, long range artillery, right? We focused on uh, combat aircraft to deliver those effects. Their view is rockets are a lot cheaper in a box uh, and, and by the dozen or, or maybe by the, by the millions. Um, talk to us a little bit about that capability and how Russia wants to always advance interests without necessarily getting into a head-to-head -head fight. Sure. There's two things to say on that. One is in terms of conventional capability. As I said, the Russians have a limited amount of very high quality equipment. Um, and so they can use precision fires. They can use precision guided munitions. But if you look at Syria, an awful lot of what they're dropping in Syria is old dumb bombs. And so again, you get this tension between what they can do at the high end in a limited way and the limitations of the remnants of an old mass Soviet-style army. Um, and so again, we have to respect that capability. And certainly, um, Russia's neighbors need to be well aware of Russia's capability for using violence and its limited ability to use very high-tech means, but also to keep that in perspective and be aware of those limitations. Now, the flip side of that is the political angle. Uh, and hybrid warfare is the term that we're using now. That's just the term of art. Um, it's an old concept. I mean, George Kennan talked about political warfare. It's an old idea. Uh, and certainly, states find that military action is very expensive. 
Uh, and if there are ways to achieve their ends short of that, you can do that. And Putin and the Russian state have gotten good at finding ways to try to use non-military means to achieve their ends. Um, and so that can be uh, the little green men, sort of soldiers out of uniform. It can be economic pressure. Um, and that economic pressure can take a variety of forms. Um, Russia has used economic sanctions against Georgia, for example. Um, simply Russian money can corrupt political systems. Um, for example, uh, lots of high-end real estate is sold to high net worth Russian individuals. And so in a sense, there's an incentive for certain parties in the West to not look too closely at the sources of money. And that's a way that Russia can exert influence, short of using military force, in a way that undermines, divides, hamstrings, potential adversaries, uh, but without ever using military force. Um, which is uh, very Soviet, right? I mean, if you look at uh, uh, Soviet writings of the era, you look at the Matrokin archives, for example, which is still an extraordinary book, detailing exactly how Russia was advancing its interests in free societies around the world to effectively undermine them, whereas our ability to undermine them at home was relatively limited. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's an, a good observation, and there's some interesting parallels and as well differences. Um, the Soviets were always, I think, fairly crude in their efforts to use propaganda. They just weren't good at it. They didn't get Western societies. Um, Russia today, because it is a much more open society, I think understands the West better. Uh, I think there are still big limitations in its understanding of the West, but the fact that Russia is such an open society now means that Russians have a better way, are, are better at calibrating the way they can use their propaganda. Um, in addition, the fact that Russia now is so open to the outside world, and Russian oligarchs would be fools to keep all their money in Russia, um, they have a ready-made mechanism for injecting Russian cash into Western systems in ways that the, the Russian state can use to its advantage. Do you, what are, what, are, what are the strategies the United States and its allies need to start employing to counter an adversary that is so hydra-headed in many respects, right? I mean, it, you know, when you cut off one hand, you know, sort of five other heads pop up. You know, you talked about uh, the soft power, the investment. Uh, you know, there's a friend of mine who is uh, in New York real estate, and he said, look, go stand on Park Avenue and look at all the buildings. Half of the apartments are dark because half of them are owned by Chinese and Russians who don't actually live there anymore, in part driving prices up, right? I mean, that has a whole series of other sort of uh, uh, challenges that go with it. But talk to us a little bit about what the approach is as somebody who thinks about the challenge and the problems being presented, what are the ways to fix some of these challenges as allies, given, given you're, you're looking at a country that does want to invest very small amounts of money, for example, the election tampering, by all accounts, you know, that Internet Bureau was costing one hundred, you know, one and a half million dollars a month, and, and it may have, and, you know, it has hamstrung the American political process, perhaps for many, many more years to come. Yeah. So I think uh, you, you've hit on something important, which is that to fix these problems, we need to fix ourselves. Uh, I think it's much less about actively countering what the Russians are doing. It's a matter of getting our own house in order. Um, tighter restrictions on money laundering. Um, being much more careful about how we use banking re uh, regulation. Um, just to see, to make sure that the sources of money are transparent, that there's some sense of when uh, money that's coming into Western financial systems is clean and when it's not. Um, we did a lot after 9-11 to be careful about how money flows internationally, and I think we may have uh, let our, uh, taken our eyes off the ball, in, in a sense, in looking at sources of cash. And again, I understand the incentives. Um, if you're bu building high-end real estate, um, it's in your financial advantage to be not too careful about where the money is coming from. Um, so uh, monitoring our own financial system is an important part of this. Um, Russia is able to use the weaknesses of Western political systems. Clearly there are political divisions inside the West that Russia has been able to exploit with fake news, with propaganda, with these troll farms. They are able to use existing divisions. Uh, when you look at the sorts of political advertisements that Russia was using during the 2016 campaign, it was very, very clearly designed to divide. They were playing on existing divisions and making them worse. And so again, that's a problem that we have, and fixing those problems, I think, is the best way to defend ourselves against what the Russians are trying to do. And, and what are the ways, uh, right, uh, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Um, so what are ways that countries can undermine mm. uh, Russia and the Russian government, and Vladimir Putin in particular, um, given that no matter how tightly controlled Russian state media is, th other media can still get in there. And not everybody, you know, it, it, the polling that everybody uses about how popular Vladimir Putin is 
are polls that are released by Vladimir Putin. <laughs> they are not necessarily indicative of how the Russian people necessarily feel about their, uh, their, their leader. So talk to us about what's the way for us to get into their decision cycle and put some uncertainty and magnify discontentments that exist within the Russian system. Sure. I mean, there was a proposal, uh, this is now several months ago, to um, if Russia hacked our elections, let's hack the Russian elections. And I thought that was a bad idea because the Russian regime is very good at hacking its own elections, and I don't think we're <laughs> going to beat them at that game. What I would say, though, is that um, Russians who want a, a, an unobstructed view of the outside world can get it. The Russian state controls television in Russia. Newspapers much less so, and the internet is almost impossible to control. So there are avenues for Russians to get news about the outside world. Uh, and so I'm not sure that that's really the path to take. Um, I think that the actions that the U.S. began after the Ukraine crisis are really the way to go. Um, they're putting pressure on individual members of the Russian elite. Um, they're putting financial sanctions on Russia that have had a real impact on the Russian economy. Uh, one of the things we've been seeing over the last few years is real cuts in the Russian defense budget. The Russians are not able to buy the hardware that they want to buy. And it's because of a financial constraint that's been put on Russia as a result of Western sanctions. So I think in general terms, what we have been doing is what we need to be doing putting financial constraints on the Russian system, putting Putin's regime under limitations in terms of what it is capable of spending on armed forces, um, putting limitations and restrictions on individuals in the Russian state who we can identify uh, as being part of efforts to undermine the West, and not backing off on that. I mean, I think the threat is not so much, um, I mean, the, the threat is that we abandon what's been going right. Um, we abandon the sanctions and restrictions that have actually been doing what we want them to do, which is limiting Russian military capability and actually punishing individual members of the Russian elite who've been engaging in these sorts of subversive activities. Um, and w how do you, what's, what's your sense on, you know, you, you mentioned how much pressure the sanctions as well as the desire to spend on military has caused on the Russian state budget. Uh, oil prices are going up, but it's not clear they're going up fast enough in order to be able to uh, sort of be that engine of cash when oil prices were $150 a barrel. How stable is Vladimir Putin's regime? Um, how you know, there was a sense that the targeted sanctions, you know, folks do regard the country as a bit of a kleptocracy. So the idea was these targeted sanctions will sort of pressure the capos to get rid of the mob leader who's causing them problems. That doesn't appear to be the case anymore. Talk to us about the stability of his regime and the ability of Russian coffers to be able to sustain this, given the fact that the country does have a lot of other challenges and Social spending is an issue, right? There have been cuts to social spending, which have proven to be unpopular. And so this is all one interconnected ecosystem. Yeah. So um, this is the big question. How stable is the regime? Um, and as you suggested earlier, this is a difficult question to answer. Um, if you're sitting in Moscow when the phone rings and says, well, what do you think about our president? You may or may not give an honest answer. That said, um, I think the regime is generally speaking stable. Uh, one of the moments of crisis for regimes like this is elections. Um, the Russian state is very much worried about colored revolutions. They see colored revolutions as sponsored by the CIA and sponsored by the West um, in a way that I think is not accurate, uh, but that's the way they see it. They get very worried. And colored revolutions tend to come when elections go bad, that a government fakes an election and it fakes it so egregiously that the population gets angry. Putin just got reelected. Um, so that point of danger for the regime is passed. And so now he's president for the next six years. And so in that sense, the kinds of moments of vulnerability are no longer there. Um, there'll be vulnerabilities down the road, but in the short term, I don't see them. Um, you asked about oligarchs and the, the possibility of oligarchs seeking to remove Putin. Um, Putin has made it clear he can make or break oligarchs with a stroke of a pen. Um, and it's hard to imagine the oligarch that's going to be brave enough to be the first one to break ranks and take the risk of going against the regime. I, I just don't see that happening. In terms of popular discontent, um, Russians, uh, it's a stereotype, but there's some truth behind the stereotype, are patient and with long suffering. Um, the living standards in Russia today um, are not growing like they used to, but they are far, far better than when Putin came in. Um, and so Russians know that. They know their lives are better. And so I think that gives Putin an important reserve of social support that he's been using for the last decade. The moment of vulnerability for the regime, I think, is the succession problem. Um, Putin's uh, term is going to be up in six years. 
Um, he's not getting any younger. I mean, he's in good health. He takes good care of himself. You know, he doesn't drink or smoke, and he exercises. So uh, it's not as though he's unhealthy. But nobody, Especially shirtless. <laughs> there we go. I mean, and this is, certainly this is part of his image, is of a tough guy who's healthy and robust and can be in office forever. But nobody could be in office forever. And it's not clear what the mechanism is that allows him a graceful exit from power. Um, Yeltsin was able to make a safe exit from power, but Yeltsin was able to make a safe exit because he had Putin to hand over power to, and Putin could guarantee the safety of Yeltsin and his family. Um, how one gets off the tiger in Russian politics is a little difficult to say. Putin is riding the tiger, and he's riding it pretty well, but he cannot ride the tiger forever. And at some point, he has to hand over power. And how that happens and to whom uh, power is handed over are really very open questions. There's no obvious successor. Um, there were some people who were potential successors, but they've kind of dropped by the wayside. Putin has been slowly moving out some of his longtime associates and replacing them with people who are much younger, don't have the same sort of credibility or gravitas, um, and don't seem as though they're the kind of people that could take his place. Uh, and so that's, in the, over the course of the next five to six years, that I think is going to be the central question of Russian politics. Who takes over when he steps down? And one last question. As you look at the Russian political scene, Putin has really created a cult of personality, uh, a brand of thinking, a brand of Russian nationalism that is likely going to outlive him. What are the challenges over the longer or even on the midterm of this sort of thinking where even if you see man on the street interviews being done, um, folks, for example, expressed no outrage about the scripple poisoning. It was normal. He was a traitor. You kill traitors. So we don't understand what the problem is, as opposed to being that was the third such attack in a sovereign foreign country uh, on spies, for example, right? Markov being the second one, uh, Litvinenko being the, being the second, which I think sometimes people forget, right? The, the 78 attack on Markov. So, you know, how lasting is this mentality, this thinking, uh, that transition from one form of sort of, as you said, long suffering, um, you know, we're patient, we're Russian, we can take enormous suffering as we demonstrated in World War II and throughout the Soviet years, but that will be continuing this sort of brand of nationalism. Well, there's a Russian political analyst who has this joke. He says, when this regime falls, it will fall in 30 minutes and be replaced by one that is exactly the same. Um, Putin is not making up Russian nationalism, and he's not making up a sense of victimization by the West. Um, those ideas that Russia deserves a place at the table of world leaders and the, and the, the sense that Russia has been victimized by the West go very deep. This is not just him. And any regime that comes into power after Putin will be tapping into the same ideas and be constrained by the same sorts of forces. Uh, I mean, one example of this is that the, the, the key opposition figure at this point, Alexei Navalny, um, is a Democrat and talks about the importance of a democracy and an end to corruption and cleaning up the Russian state. But he's also very clearly a Russian nationalist, and he sees Russian interests as very important. Um, and so the next regime, who's ever in power, um, may approach foreign policy a little differently. But many of the basic issues that cause problems between Russia and the West are not going to go away. They might become slightly easier to manage, but maybe not. Uh, but they are certainly not going to disappear. Uh, I think it's a tendency in American foreign policy generally to personalize that the problem is one bad guy. And if only it wasn't for this one bad guy, everything would be fine. Um, and that's often simply not the case, that countries disagree. They have clashes of interests. And the, those clashes of interests don't disappear simply when one person replaces another person at the top of the political system. Dr. David Stone, Professor of uh, Strategy uh, and Russia expert here at the Naval War College. Sir, thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Good to talk to you.